feel terrible. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I appreciate it. That I look back on those texts and uh, I put a lot of stock in what you thought, but <laughs> I'm glad. I, I'm glad I still went to Seattle. It was a good experience. It was. I, I was happy for Buffalo. I had a lot of friends there. I had a lot of people there. But I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't uh, a little having a little bit of buyer's remorse. You know. So let's. So Deshaun Watson is 25 and now potentially on the market, which is you know, Greg, because of the franchise tag, it just doesn't happen. This is not what happens in the NFL, especially for star quarterbacks. So if you were his agent or or Deshaun, what would be attractive to you? And what would worry you? Is there is there something that you would say, okay, I'm not going there? And is there something that maybe that's underrated that would attract you to a team? Yeah, so first and foremost, he's leaving Houston because he just views it as just like institutional chaos. I, I think that's really the, the reason they're in this predicament. They've traded away so many good players. There was really no organizational structure. There was no GM. The head coach was the GM. There was some kind of infighting amongst higher executive levels about who was in charge and who was making decisions. And I think he's just like, I'm too young. I'm too talented. I have too many things I want to accomplish. I can't be around this nonsense. So here he is forcing his way out, which is you know almost unheard of in today's NFL for a young star quarterback to be available, let alone publicly be asking for his trade. I think when you go down the line, the, the clearest fit, as far as offensive head coach, young-minded offensive kind of innovative head coach, team built to win, was just in the Super Bowl a year ago, is the 49ers. I think San Francisco, if they could somehow land him, I think they immediately go to the top of the list, at least in the NFC, and saying that they're they're the favorite, right? I mean, we just saw what that team was able to do when they were healthy, the young defense that you're not really paying anybody much. I mean, to me, That's that's the team again, whether that's possible or not. I think that's obviously the number one fit. And again, with Kyle Shanahan and an offensive young minded head coach, I think that's that's the dream, right? That's what every young quarterback is looking for. Uh, But there's a couple issues I want to talk to you about. Um, You know, the game behind the game in the NFL. Okay, there's there's the game and then there's stuff that's going on that you've been around the league. You get it. So I theorize that the Rams have gone public with this Jared Goff stuff, McVay and Sneed, in harmony. And they've done it, not because he's a bad kid, but because they did him a solid by signing him early. They're now trapped by his contract. He's regressed. And they went to the agent and said, okay, let's redo the contract. (laughs) And the agent said, no, we're not going to do it. So they're going to go, okay, then we're going to call out your client publicly. That's my gut feeling on what's happening. Right, I, I can't think of anything else because by all accounts, Goff's a nice kid. He almost never talks. He's like really, really quiet. What do you make of suddenly the Rams front office yesterday leaking it that uh, we don't even know if he's going to be a starting quarterback next year? Yeah, I mean, there, there's something going on, right? I mean, most organizations that are fully committed to especially a young quarterback, they bend over backwards to publicly support and empower that player. You never, whether they behind the scenes feel a different way, the public narrative from these organizations is always to do whatever we can to protect the confidence, protect the development of our most valuable asset. And in regards to Jared Goff, you touched on it earlier, the contract they're paying him, they're at a little bit of a crossroads. It's in when we were getting ready to play them um, in the wild card round and he was injured and he had the surgery the prior week of the last week of the regular season and who was going to start was it Walt Wofford or him internally. I know a lot of us thought that it almost gave, the Rams a chance to make a move that they thought allowed them to be better. I think Wofford's ability to, to run around and get out on the pocket. I remember we played him twice this year and watching golf. They do so much boots and naked. He's, he's out on the perimeter, but he's not a runner. He's zero threat to really advance the ball at all as a runner. So teams don't really have to come up and defend him. They see everybody staying back. He's on the edge. He's running, but he's really no threat. And I think all of a sudden they put in the other kid and, He's running and diving, converting third downs. All of a sudden now they're running their rollouts and their boots and their nakeds. And now defenses are coming up to tackle him. Now guys are open downfield. And I think McVay said to himself, this adds another element to our run. You know, this adds another element to this playoff run. And um, all of a sudden he starts against us in the wild card round. He doesn't really make it out of the first quarter or so. And Goff came in and played pretty well. He was healthy. So if he was good enough to be the backup and come in, there was something weird about him not starting that game. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The, the whole thing just didn't sit right. And when Wofford took the first snap, we were like, hmm, 
I, you know, it, it was interesting. Yeah. No, the, the, your point is he was good enough to play and they essentially benched him. They just didn't make it public that they benched him. That's what, that's what you're saying. It did, it did, and again, I, I'm, I'm speculating, right? If I always find it funny guys that are injured, he's in uniform and he's an emergency player. They do this a lot with like injured offensive linemen, right? They keep him up as the, if he's in a uniform at some point he could go in the game. It could be on the second play of the game. If he's good enough to be the backup emergency and he's your guy, then he should be good enough to play. He ended up playing, you know, three quarters against us anyway. Um, you know, it's interesting. The Aaron Rodgers drama post game, um, you know, it's weird. It's an organization without an owner. Uh, it's the smallest market. Maybe Aaron doesn't really have a sounding board. He's a single guy. He's not married. You know, I mean, he's, you know, maybe this were his sounding board. But it did kind of create a little bit of a, a chaos where everybody had to clean it up for three or four days. How is Aaron viewed in the league? Like, I don't think, and we've seen this with certain stars. Some are passive aggressive. Michael Jordan was confrontational. LeBron early was a little more passive aggressive. Like, do, 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 are there players in the NFL that say, yeah, Aaron's talented, but he does feel like a lot of work. I mean, he's, that, it just felt like it was unnecessary commentary after a game that became kind of a mess. It was. And, and I think we've all been in those positions where you think back to things you said in the post game and, and you're like, you know, I, I probably didn't need to cause that, you know, that storm uh, on myself. I know how I view him uh, and this might differ from other guys, but I, I love his whole moxie. I love his whole attitude. I don't need my quarterback to be how everyone else needs him to be. I think you can, you, they come in all shapes and sizes. They are, they come in all different personalities. And I think his kind of chip on the shoulder kind of look out of the corner of his eye and give you kind of a smart, a smirk. And I, I, I think that's just him. And, I think I'm sure if you ask the guys on the Packers, they love it. Um, I know if I was on his team, like I would embrace that. I think he is true to who he is. He's not for everyone, but I'm just not of the, of the mind that every quarterback needs to fit this certain mold and always say the right thing, do the right thing. He wears his emotions on his sleeves. He's not afraid to say things when he doesn't think things are right. I, I love Rogers. I think his personality, his demeanor, his attitude on the field. I, I love everything about him. So, listen, I love Russell Wilson. That's why I texted you and told you to go to Seattle. But I have to be honest about it. I didn't love their schemes. I think they run it too much. It's frustrating for me. There's been analytic people like Warren Sharp who have come out and been highly critical of the offense, which is far too run-centric. And the reality is Patrick Mahomes' nine losses in the NFL, Greg, you have to score 36 to beat him. Okay, so like that's the reality of the NFL now. You were in Seattle for a year. I don't want to put you on the spot, but did you sense some frustration from Russell, who's not the guy, he's not Aaron Rodgers. He's going to say, go Hawks, I love my team. That's who he is. But did you sense a little frustration? Yeah, Russ is the most consistent, dialed in at all times, never has an off moment, never has a lapse in concentration player, not just quarterback, player I've ever been around. I mean, it didn't matter if it was a Zoom call in April with a handful of guys learning the offense or if it was the Friday practice before the playoff game. Like, he he doesn't have anything other than on. So first and foremost, that just to be around him and experience that firsthand was, was a huge treat and was a huge, you know, kind of, it, it was a great experience for me as a player, especially at this stage in my career. I think as far as it goes to our offense, you know, when you look early on in the year, uh, the defense was finding their way. They were kind of, we had some new pieces. We added Jamal. We had, we had some really talented guys that were kind of trying to find their mold. And I think as a team, the philosophy was we got to go out and try to score 40, right? So the, the breaks were off and we were just rolling and it was shots and it was attack. And we were in full court. It was like, we were full court pressing from the opening tip. And that formula won. We won some high, we won some high scoring games. We won some score with some games there at the end and two minute drive. And that really seemed to be our energy. And, and then there was kind of like this shift where all of a sudden halfway through the season, the defense really started playing well and they really started to find their groove. We got Jamal Adams back. He was injured earlier in the year and he obviously made a huge, huge difference. And all of a sudden now we didn't go into games philosophically saying we need to score 40. You know, so now we kind of we reverted back to a little of that old mantra of our defense is really playing well this back half of the season. Let's not put them in tough situations with turnovers. Let's protect the ball. Let's run the ball. 
and really the magic that we had the first half of the year, we kind of flipped our mindset and yeah, I mean, and at times we, we questioned it, but we continued to win. We, you know, we won 12 games and, you know, winning, you know, justifies every decision, but you know, we, we just didn't have enough juice there down the stretch offensively. And it kind of reared its head there in the, in the opening round of the playoffs. By the way, tell people at Fox, Greg Olson, Fox sports analyst, he just retired a couple days ago, a Sunday. So what are you going to be doing for us? Yeah, so this uh, this some um, this season, um, I've had some really cool opportunities, and a lot of them were through Fox to call games on my bye week. Uh, a couple years ago, me and Kevin Burkhart called the game. Uh, last year, Kevin and I called five weeks of what turned out to be the only five weeks of the XFL schedule, and we got to work together. So uh, I'm going to be joining a broadcast crew this season. Uh, a lot of those details are still kind of being flushed out through through Fox, and and it'll be announced as we get closer to the season, but. I'll be full-time calling games every weekend. It's something I've really enjoyed doing. I love studying the game. I love the preparation that goes into it during the week. It's, it's very similar to my preparation as a player. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. it. I obviously have a lot to learn. And as we all know, that that line of work comes with its fair share of critics. And uh, <laughs> I'm, ready. I'm, I'm ready for that. So I welcome the challenge. And I'm, I'm really excited to join the Fox group. I had a great time with you and, and everybody, Tony and everybody on Sunday before the championship rounds it's just a great group to work with and uh, i'm looking forward to it all right buddy great having you on the team man all right always enjoy it colin we'll talk to you soon all right greg olson who had a great career 14 years